Yes, it is. So my name is Kate. Um, Kayla took half my intro um, introducing myself, but it's okay. We'll go over it again. Uh, I am the student pastor of Alive Wesleyan Church Central Campus. Um, I want to say thank you guys for being here today, uh, for giving me a few minutes of your time. I also want to thank uh, Quint Pitts and Michaela for having me here today and the whole uh, SWU Chapel team. So thank you guys so much. Um, I do have a very cute husband. He's right there. Um, <laughs> we have a picture of him right here um, but we um, we got married about two ish years ago a little a little less than that um, and that's us at Disney uh, I don't know how many of you guys like love Disney or you're like yeah I knew a few of you I knew it uh, some of you maybe take it or leave it I, I like it but that's us there um, we also have two cute dogs Noopy and Honey so Noopy, it's like Snoopy without the S. Noopy. Um, and I've got a picture of both my dogs here. Noopy is the one in the back, and Honey is the one in the front. Noopy is very much my dog. I got him in 2020. Um, he's very clingy. Uh, he loves long walks and long naps. Can I get an amen from anyone out there? Me, me too. Yes, long walks, long naps. Me, you, and Noopy, we love it. Um, Honey is very much Dan's dog. Um, I've got a picture of them together, uh, Dan and Honey. Dan decided that Noopy was too much of my dog, and he wanted a basset hound as well. So he researched for weeks and weeks to find a litter that had honey. Um, and I think we drove like nine hours in one day to go get her. Um, it was like he, he calls me at work, and he's like, we need to go. We need to go get this dog. I don't want anyone else to get her. Uh, so we drove down to Georgia, and we picked her up. Um, and like I said, Honey is really Dan's dog, and a few months after we got her, I get a frantic call from my husband. He's like, I lost the puppy. I don't know where she is. And I'm like starting to freak out. I don't want my dog to get hurt either. So I'm like trying to grab my keys. I'm like, I got to race home, help, help him find her. I hear the door open over the phone and he's like, she's nowhere inside. I can't find her. I don't know where she is. And I'm thinking through, could she be hiding somewhere inside? Was she in the restroom? Was she in her kennel? Where could she be? Like, I'm freaking out. He's freaking out. We're both like, what? Like, you know, you my heart is in my stomach and then I hear him open the door to go back inside and there's immediate relief in his voice and he's like oh, she's right here she's right here don't know where she was but she's right here now she's safe she's okay um, it wasn't until a few weeks later that we actually figured out where she was hiding um, I have a picture here and she had found a spot in a basket and she'd hidden herself in the basket. It is so, so cute. Um, do we have that picture? There we go. She had hidden in herself right there. We just couldn't see her asleep in this little basket where we had a bunch of blankets and stuff. It was adorable. Um, but this idea of losing something that's valuable to us, I think is something we can all relate to in some way. I know we've all probably like lost our keys or lost our student ID at some point, right? But there's something about losing something that's valuable and important that we kind of freak out about when we lose that thing. It's why Daniel was so frantic. We live beside a busy street. So Daniel was worried maybe she gotten out and she could, she could get hurt very easily. Um, or I know this thing about basset hounds that they, uh, they follow their nose, right? They'll follow a scent. And sometimes they'll follow it so far away and they'll look up and realize they don't know their way back home. Uh, so I'm not sure if Dan knew that or not, but I'm sure he was afraid. What if she gets lost and can't find her way back home? And I wonder if sometimes God has similar feelings for us when we get lost. Because don't we get lost sometimes? Don't we, don't we like to try to hide from God? And I wonder if we are, like, we are so valuable to God, and I wonder if sometimes he has some of those similar feelings about us. And we're going to be reading in a story today about Hosea. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and it's not one uh, I heard very often growing up, but as soon as I heard this story, it grabbed me in a big way uh, because we get such a beautiful glimpse of God's heart. So if you guys don't mind, let's pray, and let's jump into this story. Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us here. Thank you, Lord, for being so loving so, so big, so mighty, um, and yet you love us so. Um, 
God, I just pray that as we get into this message and figure out um, what you have for us in the book of Hosea, uh, that we would tune in, that we would tune our hearts in, Lord, and that uh, you, would, you would preach to us, Lord, that you would speak to us directly. I love you, Jesus. Amen. So the book of Hosea. Hosea uh, was a prophet in the Old Testament, and it was a prophet's job to call the people of Israel back to faithfulness in God. Uh, All the way in the beginning in the book of Genesis, um, right there at the start, God calls the Israelites to be his special people, his chosen people. And uh, there kind of was this, um, this cycle that we see the Israelites go through where God calls Israel to faithfulness in him. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't have any fake gods. Don't have any idols. Worship only me, the one true God. And then the Israelites are like, yes, we're on it. We're doing it. And then all of a sudden they start to stray from God pretty quickly. And then they start worshiping fake gods. They start worshiping idols, man-made things. Um, And then in this cycle, uh, somebody comes and they call Israel back to faithfulness. Stop, throw away your idols, be faithful to God. And the cycle goes on and on and on. And so it was these prophets' job to wake Israel up and call them back to faithfulness in God. Don't have these fake gods. And by the time Hosea is on the scene, idol worship This cycle has become part of the culture of Israel. Idol worship was entrenched in the culture of Israel, a a culture that was supposed to look like God, that was supposed to mirror God's image, but here they are worshiping fake gods, and that's a part of their culture. Hosea comes on the scene, and they had abandoned God, and it was Hosea's job as a prophet to wake them up. So Hosea takes on a very unique position and he compares Israel to a cheating wife. Now, I don't know about you guys, uh, but I watched about 14 or 15 seasons of Grey's Anatomy. Um, I, any streaming service you can go on, there's going to be that drama that's like 15 seasons long and like one person's life where it's like, how could this many tragedies happen to one person's life? Um, and I kind of imagine the book of Hosea was this drama for Israel. Uh, Being compared to a cheating wife was not something I think they were used to at the time, and I read this story like a drama because it is pretty dramatic, but God is trying to make a dramatic point in this story. So uh, Hosea, as he is spilling the tea, if you will, in his, in his prophecy, we do get a glimpse of the betrayal God feels when we are not faithful. In chapter 2, Hosea says uh, Israel is like a prostitute. And in verse 5, Hosea explains that like a prostitute, Israel, the nation of Israel, chases after her lovers, sells her body for food and clothes and drink, the things that she needs. Yet, if we look just a few verses down, we actually see that it wasn't these fake gods, these lovers that gave Israel all she had. It was actually the one true God that gave Israel all all she had. And not only did God provide what Israel needed, but God provided what Israel wanted. I mean, they talk about food, clothes, and drink, but also silver and gold. God gave Israel everything she needed, everything she wanted as a nation. And this metaphor is already pretty strong. It's a pretty strong metaphor, Hosea. I get it. That's dramatic. I'm with you. But God calls Hosea to take the metaphor one step further. And God calls Hosea to actually marry a prostitute. A man of God entering into an intimate marriage relationship with a prostitute. So let's start at the beginning here as we try to figure out who are we in this story? What can we learn from this story about God? We're going to start in Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea enters into a relationship with a woman named Gomer. Uh, Don't name your daughters that. I'm just saying, for me, 
It's not a pretty name, but Hosea chooses Gomer as, as his wife. Um, and we don't know too much about their life together, but what we do know is kind of heart-wrenching. We know that Hosea chose Gomer and saved her from a life of prostitution she would never need to go back to. And we know that in their time together, Gomer had three children, and Hosea loved each and every one of them and cared for them. By all accounts, what we read in the book of Hosea, we can, we can conclude that Hosea is a good husband. He loved Gomer, he loved their children, he cared for them, he gave every, them everything they needed and the things they wanted, and yet Gomer still chose to go back to her life of prostitution. Hosea was a good husband, but she chose to go back to a life of prostitution. And legally, Hosea can divorce her for this. Legally, he can be done with her. And even, we know that even in the uh, early books of the Bible here, as the laws are laid out, we know that Hosea can actually bring Gomer into the street and have her stoned and killed. Hosea could do that legally, but he doesn't do either of those things. Hosea 3.1 says, Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. And this is it, guys. This is it. This go and love your wife again. It introduces us to this idea that's echoed through Scripture time and time again that God's faithfulness endures long after we broke our commitment. Can I tell you guys that the human race has utterly failed at faithfulness? I know faithfulness is something that Swoo Chapel has been going over, and it's something that we're called to, and it's something we should do, but it's something that we fail at time and time again. We were called to be faithful to God, just like the Israelites were. Christians, we are supposed to only worship the one true God, but don't we make idols for ourselves? Don't we worship fake gods, things that we create? Don't we worship money and popularity and sex and media? Don't we worship even our own abilities at times? We worship all these fake gods. We love our possessions and we love the things that society tells us that we should love. But God offers a never-changing love, a firm foundation, a life with purpose and meaning, yet we throw that all away to find purpose and meaning in a fickle world to try to find love and broken people. We worship all kinds of fake gods. We make idols for ourselves even today. Yet God still keeps his promises. God continues being faithful long after we broke our commitments, long after we failed. God continues being faithful, chasing after us. So Hosea goes and loves his wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. And the preacher, Judah Smith, kind of illustrates what this walk may have looked like. Scripture doesn't say explicitly how Hosea felt or what it looked like for him to go and find his wife, but we can imagine what that was like. We can imagine the pain in every step Hosea had to take. We can imagine that he worries for his wife's safety and he hopes that she still loves him. And as he goes to find his wife, he has to walk down those streets, those kinds of streets that men of God should never walk down, but he's there and he's looking for who? His wife. And he finds her. Hosea 3.2, so I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Don't miss what's happening here, friends. Don't miss it, because it's pretty important. Gomer is Hosea's wife. Hosea, she's already yours. What was it like for Hosea to see his wife being sold to the highest bidder? Did he call out to the, the person selling her? Hey, wait, hold on a second, that's my wife. Only to be told, sir, I don't care who you think she is, but this is her price. And he bought her. He bought her back. See, what's happening here 
that I don't want you to miss is that Hosea is paying for the life that Gomer chose. In the narrative of Hosea, we have uncovered another truth that is so specific to our life even today that our salvation is based on God's faithfulness, not ours. And I am ashamed at the correlation because in this story, I'm not Hosea. I'm Gomer. I once belonged to God as my creator. He knit me together in my mother's womb with care. He loved me from the start with no conditions. He gave me everything I needed, a family, a mom and dad who loved me, two sisters. He gave me the things I wanted. I had great friends. I had a great church community. And yet my junior year of high school, when I was faced with the first hardship of my life, I abandoned God. I chose the path I thought was easiest at that point. I chose to love myself before anyone else, even God. And then that selfishness I had chosen made me a slave to my sin. I had no hope and no love in my heart. I had become a shell of a person chasing a good time, yet never finding any happiness. I wonder if you do that too. Chase a good time but never find happiness? I did, for sure. I was no longer able to make the right decision, even if I wanted to. I was bound by my bad choices, and the sin that I thought was easy and fun at the time had piled a debt so high I could never pay the price. And that is where Jesus found me, desperate and broken and alone. I had become this person that I didn't really like anymore. And Jesus bought me back, but the price wasn't cheap. The Bible says that the, Lord's, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, that the world is all, God owns it all, you guys. Mankind is the unique possession of God, yet we chose to leave him. We chose a different master that enslaved us, and we chose wrong. We chose wrong. We abandoned the God that created us, yet 2,000 years ago, God paid a dear price. He paid for what he already owned just so we could have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. God sent his son to die in our place to pay for the life that we chose just so we could have the opportunity to be in relationship with him. And that is the gospel that is the gospel that saves us. Can I read to you guys Romans 5, 8? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we loved him, not because we'd fixed ourselves, not even because we were looking for him, but just because he loved us. That while we were still sinners, he died for us. He paid the price. So Hosea bought Gomer back. And after the exchange, Hosea speaks kindly to his wife. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. And this reveals the final thing I want to tell you guys today from the book of Hosea, that God's faithfulness invites us home. God's faithfulness is a painful pursuit after our sinful hearts. No other religion has a God like that. We can read about the life and ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, and Jesus often told stories to help his followers understand the character of God. There's this pretty famous story, I think you guys know, of the lost son. Um, it was customary for the time that after a father had died that he would pass an inheritance along to his sons, but in the story that Jesus tells, the son goes and asks his father for his inheritance early. He wants his inheritance before his father dies, and basically telling his father, I wish you were dead, or at the very least, I care about this money more than I care about a relationship with you, more than I want you around, I want this money now. And however hurtful the words might have been to the father, he grants his son's request, gives the son his inheritance, and he spends it foolishly living selfishly. 
And he finds himself, and he ends up kind of in a pigsty, and he's feeding the pigs this slop, and he thinks to himself, man, I wish I could eat some of this slop. That's how desperate he is for food. And he thinks, man, even my father's servants have better living conditions than I have right now. So the son comes up with a plan, and we can read about it here in Luke 15. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against you, both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So the son returns home, and you guys know the story. While the, while the son was still a long way off, the father sees him. The father runs to him, and the son starts his speech. Father, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against heaven, and I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. But the father wasn't even listening. He was calling to his servants to bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. He was calling to his servants saying, prepare a feast. My son is home. Given up for lost and now found. Given up for dead and now alive. You guys may find yourself in your seats right now rehearsing your own speech. I don't deserve to be called a son of God anymore. Not after I treated God. Not after, I, not after the way that I treated these people, or not after the way that I've lived, I don't deserve to be called a son of God anymore. I don't deserve to be called a daughter of the king. You might be sitting in your seats and kind of relating to the story of Gomer. Yeah, I'm desperate and alone. The sin that I thought was easy, the sin that I thought was getting me the good life, actually has trapped me and enslaved me, and I need freedom from that. Can I tell you guys, God's calling you home. Jesus paid the price. He made the way. So come home. The things of this world cannot save you. And in fact, the world wants your heart to hurt you. But Jesus wants your heart to heal you. Come home. Let God's faithfulness heal your broken heart. Find comfort and freedom in the Lord. The scriptures say, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Get rid of the things that you worship. Stop worshiping these fake gods. Get rid of the idols in your life and come worship the one true God. Those idols didn't do anything for you anyway. Get rid of them and worship the one true God, the God that's faithful even when you aren't. Come home. And then if you're sitting in your seat and you know the freedom of Christ, you know salvation, my hope for you is that the story of Hosea will give you, uh, will inspire you, and will encourage you to have the same passion that God has for you. Pursue God with the same passion he pursues you with. Rediscover his goodness in scripture. Interact with God and prayer, share your testimony, and preach the good news of the gospel. May it radiate from your actions and your character. Salvation is not the end of your testimony, friends. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a relationship with God. It's the beginning of the story. I was once Gomer. I was unfaithful to the God that created me. And I was once the lost son, living only for myself, until I found myself in a bad situation I couldn't get out of alone. And then Jesus found me, and he brought me home. Psalm 23, 6 sums it up perfectly. Surely God's goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Jesus, my creator, my savior. Only you could have forgiven all of my sins. Only you could have brought me home. You loved me before I loved you. You pursued me while I was a sinner. I was lost, and you brought me home. I was broken, and you gently put me back together. Praise your name, Jesus. You bought me back. Your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me 
all the days of my life, and I will get to live in your house forever. I pray, Lord, that that is true for these students. Pray if there's one out in the crowd right now, Lord, that needs to come home, that they will make that decision. They will ask for forgiveness of their sins, and they'll come to you, Jesus. You're mighty to save, and you handle our hearts gently. I love you. Amen. Thank you guys so much for letting me speak with you this morning. Y'all are dismissed to class.